Over the past couple decades, there's been this glut of research over this one question. How do people grow spiritually? Like specifically, what factors, environments, programs, styles, preaching, relationships, what things actually help people grow in the things that matter most? So what drives some people to grow in passion and compassion? And grace and truth. What causes some people to serve sacrificially, to make worship a way of life, to bring God into every conversation, to truly consider others better than themselves? What helps people grow and become more like Jesus? So one of the great findings from this research was that there are four distinct categories of spiritual growth. Um, if you were here last fall, uh, you uh, a year ago in 2019, you heard us talk about these, and our church is no different than others. There are four distinct categories or stages of spiritual growth. Um, and, and the big aha about this is not that there are just different stages, but it's that at different stages, people need different things. What will help you grow is dependent upon where you're at in your journey with God. And this is true not just in your spiritual life, but in life. So a one-year-old needs different things than a 15-year-old, than a 50-year-old, than a 90-year-old. A spiritual one-year-old needs different things than a spiritual adolescent or adult. This isn't being judgmental at all. This just is. So uh, last week for Christmas, got to talk to my grandmother and... Um, And I'll tell her something, and then she'll forget it, and I'll have to tell her again. And then she'll ask me the exact same question over and over and over again about 10 different times. But I don't get upset. You know why? Because my grandmother is 98 years old, and it is a joy just to talk with her and to be with her, to tell her the same things over and over and over again. Now, if my 12-year-old forgets what I just told her 10 times, that's a different story. Why? Because different stages of life need different things. That's normal. That's okay. Here's the other big takeaway from the research, and this is the part that kind of makes me cock my head. It it found that the American church is full, full of people who are stuck in an early stage of their growth. They're stuck in a sort of spiritual adolescence, that the average Christian in church has been in church a long time. They've sung thousands of worship songs, listened to hundreds of sermons, uh, been to dozens of small groups, but when they measure their attitude and beliefs, they found that these American Christians tend to be stuck or spiritually stalled. They've stopped growing, that no matter how long they participate in church, They don't seem to move in spiritual maturity. They are the spiritually equivalent of a 35-year-old who lives in their parents' basement and plays Xbox all day. Now, to be fair, this is not particularly new or American. If you read the Apostle Paul, you read the book of Hebrews, you find that they complained about the same things, that these people should be eating meat, but they're still drinking milk. What is new and particularly American about this is that while we are not growing spiritually, we are consuming spiritual goods and services at a record rate. American Christianity is like eating at Shady Maple. Have you ever been to Shady Maple? There's there's 200 feet of buffet, 500 dishes to serve from. That's what American Christianity is like. We have more opportunities to grow, more access to resources, perhaps than any other Christians in any other time. More services, more programs, more pastors, more churches, more small groups, more podcasts, more resources at the touch of a button. And this whole thing has been accelerated by a pandemic. You can now binge watch my sermon series the same way you binge watch like Stranger Things. If you're bored by my sermon right now, you can pause it and you can flip over and do a Google search and you can instantly find a million other sermons to watch or resources to listen to. You can pick and choose until your spiritual plate is loaded up with whatever you prefer, with whatever suits your taste. It is amazing. Now, I personally love smorgasbord, so this is a good thing, but, 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 smorgasbord's never made anyone healthy. (laughs) By and large, this abundance 
is not translating into spiritual growth. It's not making us more loving, more compassionate, more generous, more selfless, more like Christ. And if the research is right, then millions of us have stopped growing. The high part, the high point in our spiritual life is somewhere in the past. At the current rate, millions will never come to spiritual maturity. Never take the risk to go where God is leading. Never sacrifice greatly for someone else or something worth sacrificing for. Never share their faith. Never become who God is calling them to be. Unless, unless we do something differently, we'll share that faith. And that's what I want to talk about today. How do we make sure this doesn't happen to us? So this is part two of a message on, on developing a personal spiritual growth strategy for this year, for 2021. Last week, we laid, out, um, we laid things out like this. We said, there are major, major problems. And it's not just me, but everything in me and out there, there are major problems in me. There's what, something the Apostle Paul says is called sin living in me. There's a psychological dislocation, shame, pride, fear, guilt, hatred, all of the racism, all these things rage within me, but it's not just in me, it's in others as well. And it's breaking our relationships. So relationally, we are dysfunctional and full of mistrust and abuse. And it's also at a society level that this snowballs and affects not just individual relationships, but whole groups of people through things like injustice, racism, sexism, greed, and the like. And then finally, it is global. It affects our whole world. Creation itself is groaning. The whole world is twisted. But, we said, thanks be to God that he did not leave us to self-destruct on our own. That he sent Jesus to make a way through the cross. That the cross of Christ has come to transform us individually. To transform our relationships as we connect with others. To call us into a new people, a new society, the church. And to send us on mission for God that the cross is our hope, that all real change is through the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And to make that explicit, we put the cross at the center of everything we talk about here. We experience, when we experience his power in our lives, it calls us to engage God personally. And when we experience his healing in our relationships, it calls us to connect and accountable relationships. That's what we talked about last week. This week, we're going to fill out the second half of this chart, and these are the areas where I find so, so many of us are stalled out, stuck in a spiritual adolescence. Like, we might have a lot of time engaging God personally, and personally, in our own time, in our own way, we will sit and know God and feel these deep things about God and worship God and love God, but then when it comes to actually how that works its way out, in our world, in our society, a lot of times it hits a wall. So how do we keep growing in our faith? How do we let the cross of Christ pull us out of our situation and transform our society and our world? That's what we're going to talk about today. The first thing I want to talk about is serve and be served as, as a church. This is the language of GVF here. How do we how does God plan on transforming our society through us? Ironically, maybe, and or, or unexpectedly, and it, it has something to do with the church. When you read through the scriptures, through the New Testament, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 1, 4, 5, Colossians 3, according to the whole New Testament, the primary way we experience the presence of Christ in our lives is the church, not a building, but in one another, in the gathering of believers, the people of God. In biblical language, the church is the body of Christ. We are his hands, his feet, his touch, his embrace, his care, his discipline. The church is a physical manifestation of Jesus himself. This is how we experience Jesus. So in the 1940s, uh, there was this thing in the orphanages where a bunch of orphans started dying in certain orphanages. And so they sent these scientists to, to try, doctors to try and figure out, well, like, why are they dying in some orphanages and not in others? And they found, like, it, functionally, the places look the same. These orphanages where the children were dying, 
perfectly sterile, that the food sources were the same, everything was being run the same. Then finally they determined that the only measurable differences between where the orphans were thriving and where they were dying was the amount of affectionate touch they received. So they tested the theory. Only in the 1940s would you actually test this. They took some orphans, and they received daily doses of affectionate touch, cuddling, snuggling, and others were given the exact same food, clean, sterile environment, all of that, but they were never touched or caressed. And the results were the babies who were snuggled and touched turned out healthy, and babies who were not touched are much, much more likely to get sick and die. If they survive, they're likely to have learning disabilities, problems with anger, anxiety, depression, and neurological problems that actually affected their brain development. Now, do you really think that Jesus would promise to us in John chapter 14 not to leave us as orphans and then leave us to survive untouched? If you try to develop spiritually apart from the church, you will be like an untouched orphan. If you survive at all, you will develop in unhealthy ways. You and I, we are physical, spiritual beings, and we are designed to experience Jesus both physically and spiritually through his body, the church. We are meant to hear his voice through the voices of others. We are meant to feel his embrace through one another. We are meant to speak his word to one another. We are meant to gather together so that we will feel his presence. He is with you and you are not alone. When you receive this type of touch from Jesus through someone else, they are the hands and feet and voice of Christ to you. And when you reach out in love, to someone else, when you allow God's spirit to lead you to love and sacrificially serve someone else, you are the hands and feet and voice of Christ to others. This is the way God has designed it. This is the way God has designed us to be a transforming, preserving, life-giving people in the midst of our society, to be salt and light. Now the question is, how do we do this in a pandemic? <sighs> Any other year, right now, I'd be saying you need to know what your spiritual gifts are and serve. You need to be serving others in our church and, and as our church. Whether it's, it's through our church or in our church, you need to be using your spiritual gifts the way God is ta giving you talents and gifts and passions and interests. You need to be using that to love someone else. Any other year, I'd be telling you right now, you need to sign up for children's ministry because there's just something about having to teach a Bible lesson to three-year-olds <laughs> that is not only humbling, but so good for your soul. And we always need children's ministry volunteers, except when we're in a pandemic. So this year, I want to encourage you to think small. Think hyper-local. How can you serve those in your household? How can you serve those you're still connecting with, whether it's in person or virtually? How can you serve your neighbors, your coworkers? How can you experience Christ in those who are around you, be it at home or at the grocery store? How can you be the hands, feet, and voice of Christ to those in your life? And how can you experience Christ through the words and actions of others? What specific acts of service is God calling you to take on in the next week in the next month, and the next year. Maybe harder, harder at least for many of us, more humbling often. What ways are you called to let others serve you? And what ways can you experience Christ and his love for you by just humbling yourself and letting others serve you in the next days, weeks, months, year? That's the question. That's the next step. That is the thing that so often we get stalled out on that in this next year, we as a church need to be called to serve and be served in ways, get creative with that. And then when we regather again, I want you to all volunteer for children's ministry, okay?
So, how does God transform us it's through this thing? He calls the church, the body of Christ, and we experience that. We experience Christ. We experience the transformation personally and in our society when we serve and are served as the church. And then last but not least, how does God plan on reaching out beyond just our in our community, but to our whole world? And the, the GVF language for this is go on mission. Remember those days when we used to be able to go to a movie theater? It's great, right? You, see, you, you go in and you eat your bucket of overpriced, over-buttered popcorn. You sit there in the dark and you, you show up on time, but the movie doesn't start yet, right? You've got like 20 minutes of trailers that just go and go and go. And what happens after each trailer? What do people do? If you look around, the, the, you, you'll see. People look at each other and say, ah, what do you think of that? Do you want to see that? That looks kind of good. It's meant to give us a taste of the movie that is to come. Usually a good trailer is going to have like some of those key moments, action scenes, fight scenes, whatever funniest lines. Uh, um, some trailers ruin the whole thing by giving you the only good scenes in the movie. Now, I want you to imagine, if you would, what will it be like when Jesus comes back? When this world is recreated? When you have a new body? What will it be like when God rules over everything? When there is no racism, there is no injustice, there is no sexism, when the nations aren't at war? Can you, can you see that? Can you picture what it will be like when Jesus rules over everything and there is peace and the lion lays down with the lamb and we are gathered together as one people? What will that be like if you are a Christian? God has called you to be a trailer for that movie. People are supposed to watch your life and they're supposed to see a bit of goodness and grace and peace and hope and justice and forgiveness. They're meant to see the wholeness and peace in your family. They're meant to see the honesty and joy in your work. They're meant to hear the grace and love in your speech. They're meant to hear the stories and the greatness of our king so that they turn to one another and say, do you want to see that? Do you want to see more of that so that they get a taste of the kingdom that is to come? Our mission, our God-given mission is to be a foretaste of God's kingdom to this world. In word and in deed, in grace and in truth, in love and in action, we are to point the whole world to the kingdom of God, a vision of life that is truly life, a taste of life with God. The Apostle Paul describes this in Philippians chapter 3. He says, our citizenship is in heaven. Now, when Paul wrote that, he wrote that to the Philippians. It's an ancient city in, in Greece, and yet Philippi was a Roman colony. It's where, where they made buildings that looked like Roman buildings, and people dressed like Romans, and they ate Roman food, and they watched Roman shows, and they worshiped Roman gods, so that, so that when people from all over the world came to Philippi, they had a little taste of Rome. They saw a miniature what Rome must be like. The Apostle Paul says, that's what we are to be to those around us. We are to be a signpost, an invitation, a taste in miniature of what it will be like when Jesus comes, of his kingdom, of his rule, of his love, of his goodness, of his wholeness. And practically, how do we do that? At GVF, we... Uh, we have a bless strategy. Bless is the word we use. B-L-E-S-S. -S. So years ago, there was a study done, a uh, doctoral dissertation actually, on mission strategies in Chiang Mai, Thailand. This was a massive study done over like 30 years. And they studied two different groups of Christian missionaries with two different strategies. The first group were what they called converters. Can you tell what their strategy is? Their, their mission almost exclusively focused on going to tell people you need to repent, believe in Jesus, and getting people to convert, to give their life to Jesus. The second group were called blessers. They did share the gospel. They did want people to come to know Jesus. But before they did that, that's not where they started. They started by blessing people, creating jobs, improving the community, helping social programs, aiding medical and educational systems and the like. After years 
close to 30 years in the field, the results were that the converters made almost no difference in society, in the community, in the world around them. Of course, that wasn't their goal, so no surprise. In contrast, the blessers became invaluable mem- members of the local community. They had done vast amounts of social good. Again, no surprise there. But here's the surprise. Here's the thing that they didn't see coming. The blessers, on average, had 50 times more converts than the converters. We at GVF, we want to bless our community. Whether they come to know Christ or not, we want to bless them because he's blessed us. And how do we do that? Well, we, we use this blessed strategy. This is how we work this out. B stands for begin with prayer. Any real change in our hearts and our world begins here. It's an acknowledgement that we can't make the difference. Only he can. We need God to work. So who's God placed in your life? Who's he placed on your heart? Who are you praying for these days? The second is listen. Once you find someone that God has laid upon your heart, you don't begin with speaking. You begin with listening, hearing their story, hearing where they're at, hearing where God is already working in their lives. The third one is my favorite. It's eat. If you read through the Bible, you're going to find that the dinner table is essential to God's mission. He is all about getting people to the dinner table to break some bread, both in and and how he works throughout the scriptures. Now, he's designed us for sharing lives around a table, but we're in a pandemic. And unfortunately, this makes this nearly impossible. So right now, I'm going to say definitely begin with prayer, listen to people, but get creative on this. You might not be able to eat with people for a while, but maybe if you begin with prayer and listen to people, by the time uh, the pandemic begins to wane, you'll be able to actually break out the barbecue and have them over or something. Even if not, there are ways to connect with people, even if it's not physically at a table. The first S is serve. Once you've gone through this process and you truly know them, you truly care for them, you've spent your life with them, you now know how to serve them, not in a way that is for your sake, but truly meeting their needs, truly meeting them where they're at. And the last, but it's incomplete without, is share your story. Share how God has worked in your life. Share what Jesus means to you. Share your story. It might take a while to get to this place, but let me be clear. If you do everything else, but we never tell people about Jesus, we're missing it. The kingdom is not the kingdom without the king. At the end of the day, the good news is not a place. It is a person, and he is the one who transforms us individually, relationally, calls us into a new community and is ultimately going to transform our whole world and come back as king. So how do we position ourselves for spiritual transformation in 2021? We say engage, connect, serve, and go. Engage with God personally, connect in accountable relationships, serve and be served as the church and go on mission. It is so simple and so hard. Real change, real transformation, real relationships always are. Now, for some of you, you're new to all this, and this sounds terribly hard. To you, let me just say, Jesus is gentle with you. A bruised reed, a reed that is just barely holding on, he will not break. A smoldering wick, a candle that's about ready to burn out, he will not snuff out. He is not here to shame you or guilt you or trying to force something on you. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. Just trust him with the next step, with the next step. What is the next step for you in this next year? Trust him. And maybe for you, maybe it's as simple as trusting him with your guilt, with your shame, with whatever's holding you back right now trusting that he loves you. For others, many of us at GVF, you've heard this before. Your problem is not that this sounds so hard, it's that you're so bored. This seems too familiar, too easy. So for you, I'd like to lead us in a simple, simple prayer. It's my prayer. It's my prayer for you. It's my prayer for our church in this next year. And it goes like this. God, 
in 2021, do what you want. I want to follow. Whatever you ask, I'm saying yes. I give it all to you. Amen and amen. If you prayed that prayer with me, watch out. 2021 will likely be more interesting than 2020.